And uh, thank you, Tim, for leading the night. One of the, uh, it's, it's been said that one of the greatest qualities that you could have is being available. And uh, I can't think of somebody that that applies to better than uh, Tim Jordan, wherever he's at. He, he dished us. He let sing and then he left. <laughs> and I'm just kidding. But uh, I appreciate Tim and Mrs. Crockett as well, as well as our guys in the back uh, running the soundboard and the live stream for sure. And I know my mom's watching. I want to give her a shout out. And uh, so, hey, mom. And uh, I, I do want to kind of preface our, my message tonight uh, by saying this. Thank you, uh, my church, our church. Uh, you all are so generous. Uh, Pastor put out the... The bad signal, so to speak, a couple weeks ago about our uh, renovations down in the teen center, and um, uh, and you guys came through just above and beyond even what we were were asking for, what we thought it would cost, and uh, it, it's amazing. It just in a matter of just a couple days, uh, we had all the money that that I think we're going to need and uh, and or want really. I mean, that's including decorations and. And getting it all decked out. I do want to give uh, a shout out to uh, Brother Ronnie Moore, and he hates that that I said his name, but um, but I so appreciate him and just the yeah, please, please give him a hand. <laughs> just the uh, the hundreds, literally hundreds of hours that he has spent down in the teen center, and it it already, I mean, it's half tore apart, and it already looks better than it did before, right? And so it's plywood floors and half of it, but it's already better. And so, uh, but I I appreciate him just so much, and him working with me, uh, um, and and when I say that, working around me, because I feel like I get in his way a lot, but I appreciate him for sure. And, uh, and, and of course, pastor and, uh, and our church's heart for young people is really inspiring. It's a really great thing. And so just th- thank you from uh, your youth pastor. Thank you so much uh, for, for your heart for our young people. And we really do have a good group. You kind of saw it in our video that we played uh, this morning. They're, they're so much fun. And that group yesterday just happened to be uh, a lot of our younger uh, a lot of our younger crew, not a, a lot of our high schoolers were able to come with, you know, they all got jobs now, and, uh, and it's hard for them to get off on, on Saturdays, but um, so it ended up being a lot of our sixth or eighth grade and, the, and a couple ninth graders, and I just, I so enjoyed their attitudes, and everybody just had a wonderful spirit, and we, re- we do have a great group of, uh, of young people coming up in our church, and so you uh, pray with me for them. And that they'll stick around and they'll keep growing in their faith. And we have just we have some high schoolers that have gotten saved in recent months and are growing leaps and bounds in their faith. And it's and it's truly amazing to see that. And I'm uh, grateful to be a part of it. Just just a, a tiny part of it. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. It's kind of a youth Sunday today with uh, Brother Kevin uh, preaching this morning. Obviously, he, uh, he helps our church and many other churches um, with, with curriculum and, and with programming and everything else. And, uh, and, and he's been a, a big help to me, but it's, it was kind of a youth themed uh, service this morning, and it's going to be that way tonight as well, uh, because that is my heart, uh, is young people, and you know, it's funny, just to be transparent with you, there was a time, really not that long ago, just maybe a year ago, a while we've been here, where I was thinking, maybe there's, uh, you know, maybe my time in youth ministry uh, is not as long as I, as I thought it would be. Originally, when we came out here, maybe there was going to be an, a kind of an off ramp where I could do uh, some other things here at the church. But the more that that I do it, and the, the more that we're here and, and 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 working with the young people, I just keep thinking, well, maybe I got another 20, 30 years uh, doing this, and uh, and I'm I'm just so I'm I'm excited and I'm invigorated uh, about what is happening, and it, it truly is uh, uh, it's it's a it's a work of the Lord. And he's doing some really incredible things. And I, and I know he is in our younger children as well. I mean, they had, I think they had uh, nine kids upstairs uh, in junior church this morning. And, uh, and Jamie was up there with them and does such a great job. I know uh, give Sherry coverage a shout out too. She covered um, Sunday school for the children, did an awesome job. I heard from a few of those kids how much fun they had with her in Sunday school. And uh, so I'm just so grateful for our church and, 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 our, and our heart for young people here. And so 
if you'll allow me, I, I want to share with you kind of the state of uh, the youth, state of the youth group, uh, so to speak. I want to give you just some practical wisdom. I understand that a lot of us in this room really don't have teenagers anymore, or maybe you have grandkids that are teenagers, and, uh, or, or you, but all of us, most likely all of us, directly influence teenagers, or you influence someone who has teenagers, right? So I want to uh, help you, give you some practical wisdom from the Bible, and I don't claim to be a child-rearing expert in my three and a half years of being a parent, right? I'm, I'm not an expert at all, and uh, I, I love being a parent, and I enjoy it, and, and I'm excited about it, I and mean, I have been in youth ministry for going on 10 years now, and I have seen in the last few years, some trends uh, in our culture, and our society, and I want to point those out to you and maybe share with you, how can we help our teenagers? How can we observe what's happening and, and push them forward in a way that will please God? That's, that's our mission. That is uh, the goal today, is to please God. That's our, our whole purpose on this earth. And, and I love uh, what pastor's been talking about, uh, and the emphasis on the church, right? Because it really is the church's job to push, uh, push forward, to disciple and to grow believers and send them out to live their faith out loud. And so I want to help you help our young people do that tonight. So I'm not speaking from a, a place of direct experience, but I can say that this era of students is growing up even vastly different than I did, let alone uh, some of us uh, in this room tonight. And, and, you know, I was a teenager 10 uh, to 15 years ago, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm just 28. Um, I'm a young guy still. I like to think I am, although I did not feel young yesterday when we were hiking those trails. And, uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm still young. I did, however, have my first moment. I can honestly say this. Yesterday, when we were hiking and we were talking to the kids and everything, and we're just cutting up, having fun, and there was a little side conversation that I was just listening to. I wasn't involved in it, but I, I was snooping, you know, like youth pastors do, and uh, and I just felt so out of the loop. I had no idea what they were uh, talking about at all. It felt like another language, right? It really did. And they were, I swear they were speaking English. I just didn't understand the thing that they were saying. And uh, it's the first time where I really felt out of touch with young people. And, and I was beating myself up about it for a little while. Then I realized, hey, Damien, you're 28, dude. Like, maybe it's time for you to feel a little out of touch uh, with some of the younger people. And, uh, but one of the first things that you learn when you start having kids is that it really helps to have people around who form a, a sort of support group. And uh, we can all speak from experience probably on that, that it helps to have family. And I was, uh, so I've been blessed every step of the way in our, uh, in our parenting years so far to have my parents close by, uh, to have uh, my in-laws close by, or, uh, or whoever, even, even friends who formed a support group around us and, and helped us uh, be better parents. And I would like to be a part of your support system, helping your kids. I, I just want to be a small part. And uh, I Jack Kyles used to say all the time, he said, I don't have to be your favorite preacher, but I just want to be on the list somewhere, right? And so I don't have to be your favorite, uh, uh, your favorite adult, your kid's favorite adult, but I want to be on the list somewhere. I want them to, to, to feel like they can come uh, to us uh, for help. And I just want to share a few points this evening on the state of the youth. Number one, I want to point out that kids are hurting. Kids are hurting. In uh, 1 Peter 4, 12, the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. This is a, a fact of life. There's, it, it's, a, a, um, a, it's inevitable that we will experience hardship. And kids are no different. They experience uh, and, they, and they feel probably in a lot of cases harder, they feel harder than adults do, right? They're emotionally driven and, uh, and they know how to put on a brave face. And it's unfortunate that often kids know how to harden themselves uh, to situations faster than even most people do. But we will experience hard times, and young people are no different. I don't enjoy talking about COVID, especially uh, in the pulpit. Just There's so many different opinions, but I, what I'm about to say, I think we can all agree with. 
In the last two years, a lot of us, if you're an adult in this room, we're probably able to keep moving forward. Maybe you didn't go out as much, or maybe you uh, started working from home more, or whatever it might be, but our social lives and our uh, professional lives really didn't get hindered all that much, if we're really honest with ourselves. And so, uh, but if you think about, uh, uh, if you think about our kids, right, really, for the most part, we locked them in the house for a year, and uh, they didn't have structure of a normal school day. Now, they didn't see uh, their friends or interact in social settings for the most part, and, 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 I, and I would never count uh, digitally connecting as actual real life connection, okay? Phones, social media does not count for a, social, for a social life. It, it, it doesn't count. As much as you would say that to a young person, they would say, well, of course it does. Well, of course it does not. And it is not the same, just like a virtual church is not the same as coming to church. Being in your place on a, on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, whatever, whenever we meet, a virtual church is not the same as meeting in person. And so, uh, however, we did. We, we shut the kids up in the house. We gave them another screen, and we said, go ahead and live your life this way. To give you an example, it's a little anecdotal, but I think it gets the point across. Uh, in our, in the, the, the elementary school that I actually went to for uh, first grade through fifth grade in a town called Newburgh, Oregon, and in the first year, the first school year of uh, the pandemic, they said over 50% of students in this elementary school basically did not go to school for a year. They never logged on on their computers that were provided by the school. 50% never even logged on. That's not logged on and didn't pay attention. That's never logged on. And this is, this is what our kids have experienced in the last two years. Their world has changed. It's been flipped upside down, and they, are, they have experienced things that none of us ever probably even dreamed would happen. And, and as a result of that, many studies show that depression and anxiety reportedly doubled in adolescence in the last two years. Depression and anxiety doubled in adolescence. Suicide rates are through the roof. Attempted suicide rates are, are even higher. And it's insane what, we, what our kids have experienced. And, and if you'll allow me, what we've done to our kids. Uh, it's, it's really, it's criminal. Um, uh, forgive me, but I, I believe that with all my heart. And so uh, we have students every week who come regularly just walking through some intense hardship, intense pain and real pain. And, you know, the likes of which I could, I could not imagine how young people deal with the things that they do. And we have young people that right now are in court cases against their parents for abusing them. We have young people right now uh, who have real trouble and real pain. And, uh, and, and, and this is what they deal with every single day. I could not imagine how I would have handled these things. I had, you know, I had a very good life, and, and my, I have both parents, and they're still around, and they're uh, healthy, thank God, and, uh, and they, uh, they love us, and they love my kids, and uh, I have great parents. So, so does my wife. She's got two uh, wonderful parents, and I truly have uh, the best in-laws I think that anybody's ever had. And they're, they're great people and just genuine as the day is long. And uh, so I am so blessed. And so, I, you know, in my bubble, right, in my world that I grew up in, dealing with a, with a pain like these kids go through, I would have just crumbled underneath that pressure. And so kids are hurting. It is a matter of fact. My prayer for these kids dealing with the suffering is that they can find the strength to be like the Hebrew boys in Daniel, in, in the book of Daniel. Remember their story. They were dragged uh, from their homes and taken to a foreign country. And they were, they were put, this is kind of a point of this story that really we don't talk about as much as we should. And that's the conflicting position that uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put into in Babylon. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar came rolling through their towns and through their country and just decimated everything, right? Took everything over, uh, knocked uh, all the buildings down, destroyed homes and, and, and destroyed families and all of this. 
So they go from that. They saw it happen, and now these Hebrew boys, young men, uh, probably not much older than 16, 17, 18, now they're in Babylon, and while their parents are struggling, and while they no longer have homes to go back to if they ever get out, they're sitting at the king's table, eating his, uh, eating his food. And actually, they, they weren't eating his food, but they were, uh, they were sitting at the king's table. They had good food, and they stayed in the palace. Meanwhile, their parents' homes were destroyed, and friends' lives were ruined. Now, regardless of their seeming good fortune, they remembered what they were taught from their youth, the teachings of Israel and their parents. In the wildest of circumstances we find ourselves in, may we always regard with high esteem the things of God. And, you know, it's unfortunate that even in the, in the best of times, it's easier to forget where we came from. In the good times, I've, I believe that it's easier to forget that God brought us to those good times than to remember God in the bad times. And so it, it, it's crucial that we always regard with high esteem the things of God. There are so many opportunities every day for bad choices, but it's the parent's job to train their kids to do the right thing even when it's easy to give in. It's the parent's job, and that's a a crucial point, the parent's job. I want to point something else out. Hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. And uh, there's there's a few different uh, recourses that lead to this. This is, uh, I, w- I want to kind of break down for you how hurt people hurt people. The first thing we do is we resign ourselves to making sure it doesn't happen again. We say, I've been hurt, I've been wronged by somebody or something, and, uh, and w- whatever it might be, and we say, I- it's never going to happen again. I would do whatever it takes to make sure that I am never hurt again, and we harden ourselves. And our, and our hearts are hard, and in our minds, we, we resign ourselves uh, to, uh, to saying that I will never be wronged again. The second thing we do is we protect our own selves from vulnerability. So we say, it's never going to happen again. I'm never going to put myself in a position to be hurt again. And what does that mean? That means we, don't, we never put ourselves in a position to help someone else either. And so uh, it's easy. You see how easy it is and how fast we can get to the place where hurt people hurt people. And finally, what we thought we were doing when we were protecting ourselves becomes cowardice. So first, we resign ourselves to the, to the fact that I will never be hurt again. And then we say, I'll never be vulnerable. I'll never put myself in a position to be hurt again. And then that, uh, uh, that, uh, that feeling that we have, that hardness in our heart, really becomes fear, and we become cowards, running from and and avoiding at all costs any possibility of being hurt. And so uh, 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 kids need parents to walk with them through their hurt so that that does not happen, and it doesn't become just an endless cycle of wrong and pain and and, and torment. And so uh, it's a parent's job to walk through that with them. Hurt is never an excuse to do wrong. And it takes discipline to overcome hurt. And parents need to teach discipline. Um, my dad had us working as early as we can. And I'm sure this is uh, a lot of your stories as well. And as soon as I could physically push a lawnmower, not even in a straight line, my dad had us out there uh, in the yard. And, and I was uh, running, a, I remember I was I think 10 years old, and my dad said, you're going to go to work today. And I was like, I don't even know what that is, but I'll go, I'll go ahead and do it. And he dropped me off at a man in our church at his house, and he had a ton of property, and uh, kind of like, it, it was a, a, he grew some things, but it was mostly just uh, grass, and for just as far as you can see. And they, he taught me how, 10 years old, 11 years old, taught me how to drive a tractor and, uh, and use that, um, uh, use the, the manual transmission and everything else. And uh, I was out there mowing the grass, 11, 12 years old, and on the tractor just day after day, I felt like in the summer. In reality, it probably could have been just one or two days, but it felt like forever. And uh, then uh, I, he taught me how to do that. Then he gave me a weed eater, a weed whacker. 
And it wasn't a normal weed whacker like I had used at the house, right? It was, uh, it was one that had the handles right here. And so you kind of wore it like a backpack and you had your handles right here and you just swing back and forth so your back is just done at the end of the day. You know what I mean? And it didn't have string on the end of it. It had blades, right? And so 11, 12 years old, I'm running this weed whacker coming close to my shins just every 30 seconds and uh, caught him a couple times like it still got the scars uh, to prove it right but um, my dad had us working and I was I think I was making like five bucks an hour at the time just back breaking labor 11 12 years old breaking every child labor law in existence and uh, but I learned how to work at a young age and then I got older and my dad said okay you're gonna get a job as soon as you turn uh, 15 and so I started pumping gas 15 years old and in Oregon uh, you're not allowed to pump your own gas uh, still to this day except in, in rural communities and so uh, every gas station had to hire attendants to pump their gas maybe some of you remember those days and it's still the case so 15 years old, I would go to school, I'd get out at 3, I'd be at work at 4 o'clock, and I'd work until 11 o'clock at night, and to do that pretty much uh, every day during the school year, and then all day in the summertime. And then I turned 18, and my dad said, you can get a real job now. And so um, he was working at a roofing company, driving the, the big crane truck, and uh, he said, go get up on that roof, and uh, you're going to learn how you're going to learn how to do man uh, man's labor, manual labor. And uh, so I was tearing off old roofs, helping put new ones on, and uh, doing real work. And it's so important that we teach our kids discipline. We need our parents to lead us uh, through, lead us through hurt, and, and instill discipline into our lives. We need that's what parents. That's their job. That's their job. Number so number one is that kids are hurting. They have real pain. And we shouldn't uh, write it off, right? We shouldn't just uh, uh, you know, maybe acknowledge and, and just leave, right? We need to walk with our kids through hurt. Number two, and maybe the most important point tonight, is that kids need authority. They need authority. Paul, amen, amen on that one. Paul is uh, dealing with the family in Colossians 1, Verses 17 through 21, verses that you'll recognize, but I'll just read one for sake of time. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. It is crucial that parents bring children under their umbrella of authority. I'm convinced that this generation of young people has more freedom than any other. More, just unlimited time, unlimited freedom to do whatever they want. And the kids are never told no. And uh, statistics bear out that virtually every high schooler in America has a phone. Virtually every high schooler. I'm, I'm talking 98, 99% of young people has a, have a phone. And uh, g giving a, a kid a phone with no accountability, it's like uh, going to the zoo and throwing your child over the fence to the, and into the rhino uh, exhibit and saying, don't get trampled, right? It's just, it's, it's going to happen, and your kid will get hurt. Well, giving your kid a phone that's unbridled, it has no restrictions, uh, is, is, is sending your child out into your child, emphasis on that word, out into the world with no, uh, no protection, Right? And there's nothing that's stopping them uh, from just, just anything and, and, and everything happening to them. We have essentially allowed our children to skip eight years, because statistics show that about 70% of American children 12 years old have phones. We've allowed our children to skip six to eight years of their childhood and enter this kind of like quasi adult uh, uh, status with rules like go to school but also do whatever you want, right? And it's a shame. We are hurting our kids. And it's, it's tantamount to child abuse. At the end of the day, not caring for our kids is neglect, which is abuse, okay? And so uh, allowing our children to have unbridled freedom is destroying a generation of children. It, it, it is insane, uh, the uh, opinions that children have. I've had, I can't even tell you how many parents I've had that have strong uh, Christian worldview and beliefs 
and, and strong, even, uh, and it, it stems down the line to uh, political beliefs, and it's just an ideology, a way they live their lives. And parents have one set, and then their child has a completely different set, and by the time a, a kid is 16, 17, 18 years old, they've developed their own ideas, and, and really, they don't really know what they believe, but they, they know what doesn't sound right. You know what I mean? So when you say that uh, the Bible, you should take the Bible literally, well, they say, well, pro- I mean, it's just a book of stories, isn't it? Right? They, they, they know that that sounds wrong. They don't know what they actually believe. Then it's a shame that we have allowed our kids to basically go parentless because allowing them to have phones with internet access and, and un, uh, unaccountable uh, as far as text messages and, and, and phone calls go is really just allowing them to be their own person just at a young age. And it is, it, it's just amazing the trouble that kids can get in. And just, you're, you're seeing it just at younger ages, almost every year, studies come out and say at younger ages, kids are being corrupted in irreversible ways. They cannot come back from it. And, uh, and that's what studies would say. We would say that the grace of God can lead anybody back from any place. Uh, but you know, why, allow, why open that up to our children? And so, um, uh, did you know that you can be a scientist and conduct a study? You in this room, you can conduct a scientific study. And it's around this, uh, this uh, concept. We don't tell our kids no anymore, so they don't handle it very well. Okay, so here's a study that you can conduct on your own time with your own young people. So the hypothesis being kids don't take the word no very well, okay? And so now we want to prove if that's right or wrong. Here's a scientific study that you can do. Wait for your child to do something that they probably shouldn't be doing. Should take about 30 seconds, right? And then they'll, they'll get started right away. And then tell them to stop or tell them no. And what is their reaction? Probably most of us in this room, and I have a three-year-old and a 17, 16, 17-month-old um, that, uh, that understands the word no. If you ever hear her talk, that's the only word that she knows. And so she understands the concept, right? If I were to go up to my three-year-old, Arya, and say, um, uh, stop eating that crayon. If you eat that crayon again, I'm going to take it away. And she proceeds about 10 seconds later, because she forgot everything that I told her, to eat the crayon again, and I say, no, don't eat the crayon. She's going to flip out. She's going to say, Daddy, no, I want to eat the crayon. And she's not going to take that word no very well. So I have proved my hypothesis of the scientific study, right? And so each of us can do that. The fact of the matter is we don't tell our kids no anymore, The odds that if we told a random kid on the street, no, stop doing that, the odds that they will listen the first time without arguing are probably very low, okay? And this is is my kid as well. Like I said, I'm no expert, okay? And uh, you you pray for me. I got some strong-willed kids. It's that Asian side of of them, I'm I'm certain. Uh, So don't tell my mother-in-law that, though. And so, uh, but uh, 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 we don't tell our kids no anymore. And this is something that has not changed over the years, right? Uh, Parents, in general, have never been great at telling their kids no. And uh, uh, in children, there has never been a point where they have loved being corrected, right? We want, the kids want to do their own thing. It's a natural thing. But I am saying that children need to be taught that they will have authority in their lives, there is probably never going to be a time that they don't answer to somebody. And even if they are a totally independent uh, contractor, they do their own, they have their own business, they have no boss, well, guess what? You still respond to the IRS. You're still accountable to uh, the government in some way. You will always have an authority. And that authority has the rule over them. And... Uh, if there's one thing that I've learned in the three years that I've been a parent and 10 years in youth ministry is that being consistent is hard. And that's uh, why we don't tell our kids no, because we can't back it up. We struggle to back it up. 
and it, because it takes consi- consistency. Being consistent in discipline is hard. Being consistent in righteousness is hard. And being consistent in command is hard. But we have to be. We have to be consistent. We fail our kids when we don't tell them no. We fail our kids uh, when we are not consistent. And so we need, we, it's, it's crucial that we teach our kids, you will have authority in your life. Here's how you handle them. And that's a, that's a job of a parent to walk with their kids through that time. Through that time when they're teenagers and they don't want to listen to their teachers. Uh, when they don't want to listen to their parents uh, we are, are, are gentle, but consistent and firm in how we do things. And so th- that alone would solve a lot of our problems in America. Uh, telling our kids no. <laughs> that, that alone would do it. Number three, church can never replace parents. Church can never replace parents. A fatal mistake that parents make and one that cripples the spiritual life of a child is entrusting their child's relationship to God and the Bible to church. It cripples our children. When parents are no longer in charge of the spiritual welfare of their children, your children will not grow unless they are just in, in supremely impressive children. And that's not most of our children, okay? And so um, when I was talking to Pastor about this the other day. And really, when you boil it down, a church probably, if we were perfect parents, a church probably should not have a youth pastor. A, 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 like, my job should not exist if we were perfect parents. And if, if all parents led their, led their children the way that they were supposed to, there be no need for a youth pastor. The way that I look at my job, and it's, my perspective has kind of changed in the last uh, year and a half, uh, just being here and being a full-time youth pastor, is that I want to step in in the spiritual life of a, of a teenager when their parent doesn't. I would never want to uh, interrupt or, over, or try to override what a parent is teaching their children. But unfortunately... Far too often, parents are not involved in the spiritual welfare of their children. And when did it get, when did we go so wrong that we no longer taught our kids the Bible? When we no longer prayed with our children? How did this happen in America? There was a time, you read books that were written just 20, 30, 40 years ago, in America, American books that were written for children, and, and all, probably most of them, they'll have a scene in the books of, with, that's a parent praying with their child before they go to bed, if it's like a, a bedtime story, right? You don't see that anymore. In our books, we have taken God out of the child-rearing experience, and, uh, and, and parents are no longer concerned with the welfare of their children. I'll give you an example of this, and, and I'm going to be overly transparent, maybe a little bit too much, but, uh, but what, whatever. Sometimes, sometimes we need to hear it. So uh, obviously, you know, I'm the youth pastor here, and um, I, my goal this year is to incorporate our parents more into our youth program. And so I said, I'm going to type up my notes in a legible fashion so our parents will be able to read them, and I will email them out every Tuesday. And so they can read over the notes, and they can either prepare their child for what I'm going to talk about on Wednesday night, or they can talk about it afterwards. I'll even give you study questions, uh, just real simple, break it down nice and easy uh, for the parents so they can be involved in the spiritual growth, just a stepping stone, getting them toward reading the Bible with their kids, praying with their kids. And I thought that, I thought, I thought that was a wonderful idea, and, and, I, and I hope that parents would jump all over it. And so I sent, out, uh, I sent out the blast to all the parents saying, hey, go to our website, and you can still do this, by the way, and sign up for our emails that are going to be coming every single Tuesday uh, with our notes from what we're teaching on Wednesday nights, what they're going to be talking about in their small groups as well. And, uh, and I waited. And this was uh, Thursday, and then uh, Tuesday I was going to be sending out the email. Well, I checked my list 
that I was going to be sending the email out on Tuesday, and all of four people had signed up, four parents had signed up for our uh, email blasts that were going to go out on Tuesday, and I was two of them, okay? So uh, this, is, this is an indicator of how involved we are with our young people. And now, I don't mean to put all of our parents on blast. We have some really great parents that truly do care. However, we have handed off the spiritual growth of our young people to the church. And it was never intended to be that way. It was always supposed to be the parents training their children up in the way they should go. Proverbs 22 and verse number uh, 6, I believe. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. And so it was never the church's responsibility to train their kids up. Now the church has stepped up in some ways and to try to uh, supplement. Uh, however, that does, that does not take the responsibility off of the parents. And so uh, um, I, I wish I could tell you how many times I've heard someone say, well, they get taught the Bible in church. Their youth pastor would show them how to live for God. That is completely backwards, and it's never been uh, the design of God for a youth pastor, for, uh, for the church to be responsible for spiritually training our young people. It has always been the parent's responsibility. Always, and that has never changed. The Bible uh, has not been updated to say that it is the youth pastor's job to teach kids the Bible. I have, uh, I have these kids for two hours, and some of them, if I'm lucky, three hours a week, and that is not enough to raise adequate Christians. It's not. It's not enough, and it is unfortunate. We need a revival of parents who will raise their kids spiritually. Proverbs 19, 18. I love the wording of this verse. Solomon says, chasten thy son while there is hope. <laughs> chasten thy son while there is hope. There is a window of time that we have to raise our kids. And this is, uh, this is emotionally, mentally, physically, and also spiritually. There is only, uh, there, there's not an endless amount of time that we have to properly raise our children. And a lot of you know this from your own experience, raising kids that are adults now, and maybe some even have families of their own. That time is fleeting. It's short, and there's nothing we can do about it. In the time that we have our children, we, we need to discipline, to chasten them. And uh, we can't allow our own feelings to intrude on the command to discipline our children. The more I'm a parent, the, the more I see this Truth is that it's easy, from it's easier a lot of times for me to pity or to empathize or even to just plain get tired of disciplining. Right? There's only so many times that you can spank a kid before you start to think, well, they're probably going to be like bruised by now. Right? <laughs> like there's only so much that I can spank my, my child. However, we cannot give up on disciplining our child. We have a, a limited amount of time. It is crucial that we take advantage of it. Uh, chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. When uh, your child is, is bucking against uh, what you're trying to teach them, and they have no, uh, you don't see a desire for them to even learn or grow from your discipline, we cannot give up. We need to train our kids. Now, I hope I haven't come across as negative toward children. That was not my goal. Uh, and I, I, like I said in the beginning, I love young people, and, and, I, and I'm privileged to have the opportunity to work with them. And teens in, and teens in particular, that's, that's kind of my world, they have a ton of positive character traits, just innate. And society has given them um, uh, certain things that used in the right way can really push them uh, in, to do amazing things. Uh, teens generally are passionate, and they're forward thinkers, and, uh, and they care deeply about injustice and, and righting wrongs. Uh, kids have a lot of uh, really just natural, innate things and, and things that society teaches them that if we can harness them and point them in the right direction, they can do amazing things. There's so much potential 
in our young people. And I know you know this, and I, tr- I truly believe that. And they, uh, teenagers uh, generally are very authentic, and, uh, and, and, and they're just they're real people. And, uh, and it's a wonderful thing. However, we do them a disservice by neglecting discipline and our own authority. And so, like I said in the, in the beginning, maybe some of us in here, we don't have uh, teenagers anymore, and our teenagers are all grown and have kids of their own. And so uh, maybe this wasn't directly for you, but all of us influence uh, the next generation at some level. So let me challenge you, encourage you to teach our kids discipline, that they will have authority over uh, them their entire life. Teach them how to say, uh, teach them how to accept no for an answer. And then also understand that kids need our help walking through their hurt. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for what you've done for us. And I pray that we take this challenge tonight and that we would help a young person as they deal with pain and, and with trials. God, I pray that you would help us to uh, teach young people that they will have authority in their lives. And God, I pray that you would help us uh, to uh, lead our kids spiritually, not pass it off onto somebody else, but that we would take responsibility for how they mature. God, thank you so much for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for listening so well tonight. I really appreciate you and, and coming back out tonight. And, 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 and really, just a, a great crowd for a Sunday night. And I appreciate that. I talked to a pastor this afternoon, and he told me to let you know that, uh, that he missed being here. Miss Brenda did as well. And I'm looking forward to them uh, getting back and uh, us getting back to work. And, uh, but thank you for being here. I, I believe we had a great Sunday uh, in church today. And I'll let you be dismissed at this time.